Jane has described, you know, she's linking safety with, with sustainability, but largely focusing on this safety issue. Now we'll take a look more at the sustainability of, of food packaging. Um, and I would like to invite Claudia uh, Giacovelli. She is Program Management Officer at UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. She'll be talking about how to measure environmental impacts of food packaging. Claudia, over to you. Warm round of applause for Claudia. Thank you, thank you. And I hope you can hear me fine. Um, good morning, everybody, online as well. Um, so it's fantastic to be speaking after Jane. She spoke to us about uh, human toxicity, toxicity of food packaging. And now I will continue basically the journey to try and understand what does it mean? What do we mean by sustainable packaging, food packaging, looking also at the environmental dimension. So how can we make our packaging more sustainable also from the environment? And it's wonderful, actually, the, the way you completed the inspirational talk, Jane, with, to talk about the life cycle, because that is something that I will want to focus today. Uh, we have, so I'm from the UN Environment Program and I'm part of the Life Cycle Initiative, where we basically offer an um, UNEP host the Secretariat of the Life Cycle Initiat Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder um, partnership uh, where we promote consensus building of uh, scientific method, the life cycle approaches among those, um, to try and uh, provide science-based information and data to base policy decision making. So, in terms of what, if you have not heard of this approach before, what does it mean applying a life cycle thinking to food packaging? So life cycle in general, and you will see this acronym popping up in my speech, maybe sometimes I forget to not use the acronym. acronym. So if you hear LCA, that's what I'm talking about, is life cycle assessment. And basically looks at the entire life cycle, the entire value chain of a product or a service from the extraction of the raw material all the way through its disposal. And as we are trying to close the loops, we are looking also at reuse, recycling, refurbishment, etc. So here is a bit of the loop that we would be looking at when we talk about the life cycle thinking of food packaging. The main purpose of this technique, of this method, is really that by looking at all the impacts that a product or a service will incur through its life cycle, we make sure that whenever we want to introduce a measure, we don't, burden, we don't shift the burden into another life cycle. So, of course, we have spoken, I'll go back quickly, of course, we have spoken about the chemicals that the food packaging cotton material will transfer, but with this approach, we'll also be looking at other impacts that the food, will, uh, that the food packaging, while it's being constructed, while, while it's in use, and while it's disposed, will release to the environment. As part of the, so UNEP has been in response to a request from uh, uh, governments from all over the world in 2019, uh, during its fourth session of the UN Environment Assembly, uh, we have been requested to basically collect knowledge that would help uh, countries develop policy for putting together, basically for proposing and assessing single-use packaging versus alternatives, and those could be single-use alternatives or reusable alternatives. So we have been looking at all, all single-use packaging that you have out there in the market, so from bags, bottles, takeaway, food container, so that's quite relevant here, caps, oh, okay, I touched too quickly, sorry about that. Uh, how do I do this? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, and uh, uh, nappies, menstrual product, face masks, of course, we were in the midst of COVID, so we wanted to assess this new trend. And finally, uh, just uh, last year, we released uh, the food supermarket food packaging report, meta LCA meta study, so life cycle assessment meta study. So what we will be doing today with you is really to unpack a little bit the learnings that we had from this uh, life cycle assessment meta study. 
For those who don't know what a meta study is, is basically we have not conducted a life cycle assessment ourselves, but in food packaging, in fact, there is a very vast literature already. So we have been looking at the life cycle assessment out there from various regions, from various geographies, and that we're already comparing different packaging materials and different alternatives and try to draw conclusions how did we do that? So before I go into that, actually, let me give you a bit of a uh, why was that important. In the food packaging, as you know, there is always a very fine balance when we look at packaging, in fact, between protecting food loss and the packaging materials itself. So in this graph, you will see that over the life cycle of food, in fact, there is a 24% loss, percentage of food loss wasted. And if you look at the geographical, I just wanted to give you a sense of geographically in the various regions of the world, what is the share of total food that is lost or wasted before it's even uh, consu uh, reached consumption, in fact. So North America scores 42% of food loss, followed by industrialized Asia and Europe very closely. And Sub-Saharan Africa actually is at 23%. So food packaging is really everywhere around production, handling and storage, processing, distribution and market. Because in all of these processes, when you move food from one stage to the next, it will be packaged in some shape or form. So we can support, we can make a dent actually if we start looking at more sustainable packaging choices throughout the life cycle. So going back to our meta study, we have been looking at, at 33 studies. We started from a literature review of 95 studies. We narrowed down to 33 studies, uh, looking at several criteria that these studies needed to comply with already looking at the different type products covered. So the studies needed to look at different products and multiple products and alternatives, ideally also reusable alternatives. But I must say that we are still a bit premature in that front. There are not as many life cycle assessment studies of reusable packages as much as we can find of uh, single use packaging, of course. Um, the completeness of the life cycle was a quite an important criteria for us. Uh, it was important to make sure that uh, the, the studies were looking at the entire life cycle, so cradle to grave, and indicators. We didn't want to look only at studies that were calculating the impact on climate change, for example. We wanted to look also at the other impacts like uh, eutrocity, uh, water, land use, etc. Uh, transparencies, we needed to make sure that the studies that are out there uh, give, gave enough information on how the data sources were collected. And uh, if it was industry study, uh, they needed to be peer reviewed. So, uh, because sometimes proprietary um, studies that are commissioned by industry sometimes tend to, um, depending on the assumptions that you put in the study, can lead to a certain conclusion that is more or less favorable for the industry that commissioned the study. So we wanted to make sure that all the studies that we included are really neutral or peer reviewed. And uh, the studies needed to be 10 years, no more than 10 years old, etc. So there is a whole list of criteria here. As you can see, we try to have a mix of geographies to make sure that the conclusion that we drew are actually uh, relevant for the uh, universally. And this is, I won't go right away into this because it can be scary and mastodontic matrix, but just this egg tool that we have built that you can, uh, and we will go little by little into it, but fundamentally just to explain you the structure, what we have been doing is that we use to draw the conclusion we have grouped food packaging by food archetype. So we have looked at refrigerated product, fresh produce and pantry goods, and we have tried to see what the science tell us when and what is the, the science tell us is the best preferred alternative, single-use packaging versus reusable, depending on uh, the infrastructure level, so whether we are in a context with a poor waste management system or with a good waste management system, or whether legislation are 
pushing for more recycled content or not, and consumer willingness. So when uh, consumers are willing and able to change behavior versus context where consumers are not prepared yet or are more hard to, for, for them, it's more harder for them to change behavior. So this is kind of a map that can pretty much guide uh, in understanding what is the status quo at the moment, considering the overall context related to the recommendation from a life cycle perspective. So we'll go by type of packaging. So looking at the refrigerated products, here we have basically we covered meat packaging, dairy and, subs, uh, uh, and uh, dairy packaging and prepared food packaging, so your desserts. I just am curious by show of hands here and online, I, I can't see online, but uh, you can raise your hands online. But how many are in this line of business of refrigerated food packaging here? Do we have industry producers? Great. Okay, so it's a small minority, but uh, Still great to have you here. So I hope that uh, what I'm about to, to share is resonates with you and where your research is going in the industry. So if we look at refrigerated food packaging, so we see this is back to the matrix. So we are plotting basically the, the product type versus the, the willingness or not of consumer's behavior to change and the poor or not waste management. So what it tells us here is that based on the life cycle assessments that we have analyzed, for meat products, in fact, the main priority at the moment should be to minimize food waste and packaging and have a preference for packaging that extends the, life side, uh, the, life, the shelf life of the product. Uh, when it comes to context, with the nitty-gritty, that when it comes to context where the consumer is unwilling or, unfavor or there is an unfavorable legislative context, then we can also look at minimizing packaging materials without increases, losses and, or breakages. What does it mean? This means that basically we are looking at how can we still ensure that the food wouldn't go to loss, but we can reduce his, his, the packaging weight. So we can reduce the weight of the package, but making sure that it doesn't lead to increased loss, losses of the food or breakages of the package, which would have the reverse consequence. For dairy product instead, and for dessert, the, there is no clear preference from a life cycle perspective currently on whether minimizing food waste from a packaging perspective is is, uh, more, is preferred to reducing packaging material. LCA studies, so in, that, in those cases, so if you're producing dairy packaging or packaging for desserts, the best option that we have at the moment is still to run specific LCA studies case by case to assess which of the, comparing the, the alternative that you have in mind basically, to understand whichever of the two options results in the greatest environmental benefits or the list. Moving on, if we look at packaging, oh, so I'm running out of time already, so, and I have quite a bit of more to, to tell you. <laughs> so <laughs> I will try to accelerate and just I will point you then to the resources that you can check online. But basically, so these are the other type of packaging that we analyze here, the fresh produce, so the pre-cut fru pre fruit or the pre-prepared salads. The, the fruit and vegetables and uh, the transit packaging for wholesale um, uh, of fruit, uh, fruit and vegetables. And as I was saying, so here, for example, the packaging of ready to eat fruits and, and uh, we have LCA studies that study this. And for example, if we go into the matrix, it tells us that the main priority there for the packaging should be minimizing food waste because when you have food waste, the climate impact of that food waste is much higher. But who says, and this I go back to Jane's point, can we challenge our system overall? Who says that we need pre-cut fresh fruit off the shelf of a supermarket? Do we really, can we rethink outside the box and actually challenge our system? That's why I'm saying this is 
results from our LCA studies, so what the science tell us within the current context that we have, but perhaps we can go beyond that and actually challenge what we currently have in our shelves. Uh, finally, the last set of packaging that we have looked at is the, the pantry goods. And this one is basically your shelf stable, your sauces, your, your tuna cans, your chocolates, and your pastas, cornflakes, etc. And here is the same matrix. And for this type of food packaging, actually, the returnable packaging seems, seems to be the best option. So really try to minimize as much as possible the pack whenever the food product allows it eliminate the package, move to returnable, move to refillable packaging. And this is important also for the reusable system. If you are considering going into that direction, it's important to consider that washing and distribution plants needs to be uh, decentralized, so closer to wherever your location, the, the main selling points are, rather than centralized plants. Uh, it needs to be accessible and competitive the price. So what does it mean? That is not something that only the producer can drive, but it's also a legislative issue. So we need to make sure that also from a legislative perspective, there is all the enabling condition to make sure that reuse really can get uh, mainstreamed. I had a point, and I hope I can indulge a few more minutes, but so the big question that we often hear is, what are bioplastics? Is biodegradable, is bioplastic better than other alternative? So, Overall, if you have it, one takeaway is that reusable packaging, even from an LCA perspective, scores better environmentally than single-use packaging. So if we have a choice, we should always investigate and prefer reusable pack packaging or no packaging over single-use. But sometimes bio-based plastics is, the, is, is an alternative that can be considered. But I just want to make sure that you understand bioplastic is really a term that should never be used on its own. So bioplastic is, each time this word is used, it needs to be specifying the origin of the plastic. So whether it's bio-based, it's sourced by bio stuff, so starch, uh, collagen, gelatin, etc., or whether it's end of life, it's biodegradable. So most of the, of the bio-based and biodegradable plastics that we commonly find in the market at the moment do not biodegrade in the environment, do not biodegrade in the, in the marine environment either, unless under very, very specific circumstances. So it's very important. So under industrial composting, yes, but how widespread is that infrastructure in the world at the moment. So whenever we propose new bioplast, bio-based and biodegradable alternative, please let's make sure that first we have the infrastructure in place and we inform our consumer on how to dispose of those plastics. I will leave you the, um, with these slides uh, at the end of the, of the, they will be circulated, so you will be able to go back to the, to the key points, etc. But I wanted to really thank you for uh, being here today, and we'll be around all day, so don't hesitate to come up to ask any questions. These are the main takeaways, and here are some links to the resources that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, and sorry, uh, sorry for, for pushing you a little bit. We have to try and get it back a few minutes, but indeed in the, in the comments, if you want to raise questions, please do so, and we'll try and answer them uh, uh, later, and obviously you're here for the whole day, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Claudia.